hope you're ready to flex those brain muscles. Today we're going to talk about inverse functions, what an inverse function is, and how to find the inverse of a function. So let's go ahead and get started. Inverse function, the inverse of a function reverses the original function, okay? This is the notation. We have a function that's just f of x. Then we have this inverse function notation. It looks like a little negative one power. It's not a negative one power. It just means the inverse of f, right? This is f. This is the inverse of f. So what is an inverse function? What does it mean? Well, we have this function f, and it's a function, so we know that each input has exactly one output. But in order to find the inverse of f, f needs to be one-to-one. -one. It must be one-to-one, -one, which means that each output is the result of only one input. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between all the elements in the domain and the elements in the range, right? So I can plug stuff in from the domain into f and get stuff out from the range. And what the inverse does is it basically reverses this process. So what the inverse does is it maps elements from the range back to elements from the domain. So I can plug in elements from the range of f into my inverse function, and I get out elements from the domain of f. Let's do a quick example to help us fully understand the relationship between a function and its inverse. So I have this function. These are elements from the domain, and these are all being mapped to elements that are in the range, right? So this is definitely one-to-one. -one. We can see it clearly with the arrows here. So that means I can find an inverse. If a function is one-to-one, -one, you can find an inverse. So if I have this inverse function, what do you think is going to be in the domain and in the range? Well, remember we said what the inverse does is it maps elements from the range back to the domain, right? So I can simply copy these three elements of the range in the domain of the inverse. So three, six, and nine. And then what do you think is in the range of the inverse? Well, remember these are being matched, we're reversing it. We're going the opposite direction. So we have one, two, and three. And we still have that one-to-one -one correspondence. So we notice a pattern, what is the domain of F? The domain, let's start with F. The domain for our function F is the elements one, two, and three, right? One, two, and three. The range, are the elements what? Three, six, and nine, right? Three, six, and nine. What about the domain of my f inverse, the inverse function? The domain is three, six, nine, right? Three, six, nine. The range is one, two, three. Do we notice any kind of a pattern between the domain of the original function and the domain and range of the inverse, right? Do we notice a pattern between these? Well, they're simply flipped. The domain of my inverse function is the range of my original function, and the range of my inverse function is the domain of the original function. So in general, when we have a function and we have its inverse, the domain of the inverse function is the range of the original function, and the range of the inverse function is the domain of the original function. They just flip. All right, so these are those rules written out. The domain of a function equals the range of its inverse. The range of a function is equal to the domain of its inverse function, okay? So these are really useful because when you're given a function and its inverse, it has to find the domain and range of both. If you just find the domain of the original, you can write that as the range of the inverse, right? And vice versa, you really only have to find two of those things instead of all four of them, okay? So we'll get into that in a second though. First, let's find the inverse of this function, f of x equals two x minus three. We're told it's a function because of this function notation. Technically what we do first is make sure it's one to one unless we're told it's one to one. In this case it is, but I could just simply graph this. It would be a line. It would pass the horizontal line test everywhere. So this is one to one, but technically that's the first step. The second step is I always rewrite f of x as y, right? because they're essentially the same thing. The only thing the f of x is doing is it's specifying that what we have here is a function, right? So I'm just gonna replace that with y, and the reason I do this is because in order to find the inverse of a function, what I do is I switch the position of x and y, and then I solve for y. And it would be weird to have f of x, it just makes it more confusing. So if I write it as y, then I can switch my x and y, and it just makes it a little clearer, a little easier, right? 
So I'm gonna draw an arrow here because my next step is to switch the position of x and y. So x equals two y minus three. And when I say switch the position, I literally mean where you see y, replace it with x, and where you see x, replace it with y. You're not doing algebra to switch them, right? You just literally switch them, and now I solve for this y. Now I'm doing algebra, okay? So what's my next step gonna be? Well, I can add three to both sides. I get x plus three equals 2y. So now what's my next step? Well, I can divide both sides by 2. If I divide both sides by 2, I have what I need. And this arrow just means I'm moving on to the next step. That's what I usually write. So I can divide by 2. And now those 2's cancel and I have y equals x plus 3 over 2. Sorry about the background noise. y equals x plus 3 over 2. My last step, this is technically right, this is the inverse of this function, but I wanna rewrite this y as that inverse notation, right? Because I wanna be clear that what I have here is the inverse. So I rewrite that y as the inverse notation and I'm good to go. So what if I wanted to find the domain of this and the range of this? Well, I know that the domain and range of a linear function is all real numbers. So the domain and range of this is all real numbers as well, and you can probably tell that by looking at it, but. We'll get into more examples where it gets trickier. All right, now we've seen a cool relationship with domain and range between a function and its inverse. But there's actually one more cool thing about inverse functions, and that's that the composition of a function and its inverse is always equal to x, okay? So think about an inverse function reversing the original function, and that's exactly what happens when we compose a function and its inverse, is everything being done to the x gets undone. Right, and we're left with just the x. And this works both ways, whether it's the inner function is the inverse or the inner function is the original, as long as it's a com composition of a function and it's inverse, you should get x in both these cases. So on exams and quizzes and homework and stuff, you may be told verify that the following functions are inverses of each other. And that's exactly what you'll do, is you'll plug the inverse into the original, and then you'll plug the original into the inverse. You'll do both cases, and if you get x for both those cases, then they are indeed inverses of each other. So to finish off this video, we'll go ahead and verify. And this is exactly what we just found. We were given this, we found it's inverse, but let's verify that this is true. So first I'm gonna do the inner function as the inverse. So I'm basically plugging this function in to my original function f. So I have two times this inverse function here, x plus three over two minus three Sorry about that three, it's really bad. So you can see immediately that my twos will cancel and I got x plus three minus three, that gives me x. This example is pretty easy to see. Now let's think about doing it the other way around. What if I do f inverse of f of x? So now my inner function is the original and my outer function is the inverse. So now I have two x minus three, hopefully y'all can see this down here. And I'm plugging that in for my x here. So I have the plus 3 out here. And this is all over 2. So I really don't need the parentheses. Since this is subtraction and addition, I could drop the parentheses. And I'm left with 2x over 2, which is just x. So in both these cases, I got x. And that means that they are indeed inverses of each other. We have verified it. So... Stay tuned for a part two. We will continue talking about inverses and do a lot more examples, but I hope you enjoyed this video. Hit like, hit subscribe, leave any questions in the comments, and keep flexing those brain muscles. I'll see you next time.